Historically, one of the best protections of the value of money against the inroads of political spending was the gold standard, the redemption of money in gold on demand. This put a check rein on the politician, Warren Randolph Burgess. Hi there, welcome back. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. Cervantes highlights gold as the major theme twice more in the transition between the second and third cases of Sancho. First, according to the narrator, Sancho claims he solved the case of the evil debtor because he had heard another case like this one told by his town priest, an apparent allusion to Jacobus de Voragine's medieval collection of hagiographies entitled Legenda Aurea, or The Golden Legend. Second, the third and final case begins with a reference to the Greek goddess Astrea, the last immortal to live among humans during the Golden Age. A woman drags a swine herder before Sancho and evokes Astrea. Justice, Sir Governor, justice, and if I do not find it on earth, then I will go search for it in heaven. Now, Astrea was sister to Dike, the goddess of justice, and she ascended to the constellation Virgo to escape human wickedness. Gold, justice, purity, and evil are all themes here. In other words, monetary policy once again. Note also the two references to the blood purity theme we have seen elsewhere. The woman claims she has remained a virgin for 23 years by defending herself against Moors and Christians only to be raped by this swine herder. Sancho claims he will examine this man and find out whether or not he has clean hands. The swine herder claims that he paid her for the sex and that the woman extorts him for more money. Cervantes, again, mocks government generally, for this extortion began right when the swine herder was on his way to pay his taxes. In the end, however, we return to the monetary theme. Sancho orders the man to pay the woman 20 ducados worth of silver that he carries in a small bag. Note the new monetary unit and the fact that the woman checks the quality of the money before leaving. First, she made sure the money in the purse was silver. Did you know the maravedi was simply an accounting unit during the Spanish Golden Age? In other words, it existed only in the abstract, as a point of reference with which to measure and compare the values of coins like ducados, escudos, reales, etc. After the prostitute departs, Sancho tells the man to go get his money back from her. When she drags the herder before the governor again, accusing him of trying to rob her money bag, Sancho asks her if he succeeded. She says she was too strong for him, so Sancho concludes that there was no way the man could have raped her and orders her to return the money. This is funny, but it also contains two more references to the politics of money. First, when she brags about her strength, the whore anticipates the cat episode in chapter 46 and recalls the lion episode in chapter 17, which was also about money. You'll have to throw other cats at my beard, not this miserable weakling. Pliers and hammers, clubs and chisels would not be enough to pry it from my fingers, not even the claws of lions. Second, when Sancho notes that the strength of Hercules is not enough to assault her, he alludes to the sign of Charles V found on the era's coins. Finally, note how Sancho's advice to the man is a sexualized metaphor for the importance of the gold standard, which keeps politicians from stealing the money of citizens. My good man, go with God to your home with your money. And from now on, assuming you do not want to lose it, take care not to give in to your desire to lie down with anyone. There is advice to the reader here. Do not be casual with your own money and pay attention to instances of money in Cervantes' text. Now there's something unsettling in the ironic relation between the two final cases. The founder of the Roman Republic, Lucius Junius Brutus, carried gold inside a cane in order to remind himself to keep his thoughts secret so as to avoid the wrath of the tyrant Tarquin. 
When Tarquin's son raped Lucretia, Brutus rebelled. He and his allies swore to never again accept monarchical rule. Given that the man in the second case with gold in his cane is a fraud, and given that the whore in the third case lies about her rape, Cervantes seems to mount an anti-Republican allegory here, a kind of cynical endorsement of the Habsburg monarchy as the lesser of two evils. Cervantes' perspectivism disallows easy answers. The last words of chapter 45 reveal Cervantes growing fond of his double narrative technique. And let good Sancho await us here, for we are beckoned by his master, who is all agitated by Altisidora's music. Chapter 46 is short, but spectacular. Quixotic Mission. Which royal house unleashed the first modern industrialized attempt at monetary devaluation? A. The Borgias. B. The Tudors. C. The Habsburgs. Correct answer. C. The Habsburgs. Cervantes begins with another theogma constructed around the term stitch, meaning first a temporal moment and then a stitch of sewing. Altisidora has left our hero with thoughts in his head which did not let him sleep nor relax even a stitch, which was compounded for him by the ones missing in his stockings. Notice how this zeugma turns Cervantes' text into a kind of tapestry which weaves together different stories. The next morning, Don Quixote dresses himself with Sancho's tall riding boots, a green velvet cap, his scarlet cloak, his cutting sword, and his enormous rosary. He then parades arrogantly into the main gallery. Oddly, the narrator then reminds us that the Duchess has sent Sancho's letter to his wife, Teresa. The woman question again. That's all for now. Keep reading. The story only gets better in the coming chapters. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.